So uh, welcome everyone to this week's ICTS string seminar. Uh, we have Edgar Shagulian from the University of Pennsylvania. He's going to talk about uh, the central dogma and entanglement in DC space. Over to you, Edgar. Great, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for, for being here. I'm gonna talk about some topics in the sitter space, uh, but I wanna begin by motivating um, the types of questions that I and others have been thinking about. And that motivation comes primarily from various things we've been learning about black holes in the past few years. So let's just start from there. And let's start from the simplest uh, uh, point, which is the classical black hole uh, as discovered by Schwarzschild in 1916. So here's something he wrote in a letter to Einstein as he was fighting on the Eastern front for Germany in World War I. He was a little too optimistic because the war did not treat him very kindly. He was dead less than a year later. But in any event, he discovered this solution. It has the intriguing feature that it has an event horizon. Things that fall in can't come back out. But besides that, it's a pretty boring solution. You know, all the richness of uh, black holes in our, in our galaxies have to do with how they interact with their environment. Things like accretion disks and jets and all that are interactions with the environment. If you just isolated the black hole and put it there, it wouldn't really do anything. It would just sit there forever. So in that respect, it's a little boring. And the quantum black hole, as described by Hawking, is much more interesting from, from this point of view. There isn't really a sense you can isolate it from its environment. It sort of evolves dynamically. It emits these uh, particles, which we call Hawking quanta or Hawking radiation or Hawking particles. And you can think of this particle as being entangled with some partner particle on, on the inside of the black hole. They're in something like a bell pair, okay? And as the black hole does this, it loses mass. The mass scales with the size of the event horizon of the black hole. So the event horizon shrinks down and it keeps doing this. And we believe eventually completely evaporates away leaving only the entangled Hawking quanta. Okay, so that's super interesting. Also Hawking, you know, and also preceded by ideas by Bekenstein uh, discovered that Black holes have a temperature and an entropy. They're somewhat similar to a gas in a box. Okay, here's the formula for the entropy. It's intriguing for a few reasons. One is that it scales with the area of the event horizon of the black hole. And the other reason is that it combines all of these fundamental constants from different branches of physics. Okay, if you have a formula like this, some thermodynamic entropy, it's very intriguing to ask, as Boltzmann did, uh, is there some sort of atomic description? Okay, Boltzmann provided an atomic description for a gas in a box. He said the way that you could think about the entropy of the gas in this box is you keep fixed some macroscopic parameters and then you, you know, uh, configure the microscopic constituents in all the various ways such that you keep fixed uh, those macroscopic parameters. You count all the ways you can do that uh, and that's related to the entropy of the system. So in black hole physics, there's a, a suite of ideas, um, kind of old ideas, uh, which um, we called uh, in a paper, the black hole central dogma, which says that you can think of a black hole as similar to a gas in a box. In other words, from the outside, you could think of it just as an ordinary quantum system uh, that evolves unitarily as it interacts with its environment. And in particular, the Hilbert space has this dimensionality. Okay, so this is one of the key aspects of this, of what I'm calling here, the central dogma. This formula we saw before, now I set some of the fundamental constants to one, I'll keep G Newton around, but the Hilbert space is given by this dimensionality. I call this a dogma because there's evidence for this from various points of view, for example, for you know, various uh, supersymmetric uh, black holes, um, this dimensionality uh, has, has been established to some extent, but it's a dogma, it's a belief. Uh, it's not known to be true at all in general, in particular, it's not known to be true about black holes in our universe. Okay, so, uh, so sorry, say so Edgar, can I ask a question here, just to clarify? <laughs> sure. Hi. Yeah. So, so, it, but when you say central dogma, I mean, uh, does this mean that that there's an assumption that you know the Hilbert space of the entire system factorizes into a part associated with the black hole and the part associated, with not necessary? I mean, is there an assumption of factor? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think effectively, yes. I mean, you can then sort of quibble about uh, how exactly you want to do this fact, like what you consider part of the black hole and whatnot. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, the best case where we can make this kind of a, 
factorization and talk about a dimension of a Hilbert space are these holographic models where what you would have thought is the environment of a black hole, which is separate from it, is actually included completely as part of the black hole. And then there's some super right. asymptotic faraway region, which is the part that factorizes. That's the only case that I know of where you can make this very sharp. Uh, right. For example, for black holes in flat space or something, as you know, it's uh, it's that's part of the, the dogma itself, whether or not you can try and uh, split it in this way. But, what, what, but can I just ask, I mean, why do we need, if you just wanted to count the entropy, you could just say, you know, even in flat space, there's some set of microstates uh, and that corresponds to a black hole and you don't need the, the Hilbert space to factorize. So, I mean, why do we include this as part of the dogma? In fact, I mean, I think there's evidence that that doesn't happen. So, I mean, what do we need the factorization assumption for? Sorry, sorry. What, sorry. I, I was being very general when I was talking about the factorization assumption. It's possible. Yeah. Uh, all, all I want to say is that there are two pieces. It's possible that one of those pieces is totally trivial. So I think what you're saying is if you have a black hole in flat space, you just consider that entire system. Sorry, right. Uh, let, let, me, let me rephrase. Um, okay, the main reason uh, we want this is because we want to, well, the, the main reason I'm talking about this is because I want to reference situations where you really have two pieces of the system that you can split up. As you know, the radiation from the black hole and the black hole itself. That's why I want to somehow isolate the part that I want to say is part of the black hole. If I say that the radiation and the black hole are all part of the same thing, um, right. then I can't really make um, the types of statements related to the page curve of radiation. So I'll be looking for some situation where I can split those things cleanly. That, that's why I'm asking it to factorize. I see. So, so, but that, then that, I mean, in, in all the cases I know where that's precise, you introduce a non-gravitational bath and then the factorization is in the non-gravitational system, right? I mean, with that, so maybe, maybe I can wait to ask again, uh, uh, but would that, I mean, is that fair that the cases that we know it does factorize? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah that's what I was saying that the yeah. case where we've made this precise is where you have this super asymptotic region, the flat space region or the bath region, um, which you take to be non-gravitational. Okay. Right. okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, something we have learned in the past few years, and there are sort of uh, different perspectives on it, is that the sort of region beyond the event horizon can be accessed from the outside. So often when I talk about this, I'll be um, speaking from the paradigm of uh, these islands and replica wormholes, which tell you that you collect the Hawking radiation and you can do various manipulations on the Hawking radiation. And by doing that, you can kind of fiddle with what's inside the black hole. Um, but as uh, uh, Suvrat and a set of collaborators um, uh, have argued, uh, there's another sense in which the region beyond the event horizon can be accessed from the outside, and it doesn't really have to do with collecting the Hawking radiation. It's not going to be too important to me um, as I proceed sort of which of these two paradigms you're thinking about. The basic idea seems to be that the interior of the black hole, at least at some point in time, will become encoded uh, somewhere very far away. Okay, and that is uh, compelling and exciting idea. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the analogy between black holes and cosmologies. So here I've redrawn a, a picture of a black hole. Here's us, the observer. The red dash sphere is the black hole event horizon. These arrows are just representing the fact that space is collapsing inside the black hole. And it's collapsing such that a photon or some particle is which is trying to make it out and come to our eyes so we can see it, won't make it. Okay, space is collapsing too quickly inside the black hole. That's why there's an event horizon. Now, in cosmology, in particular in an accelerating cosmology, it's sort of like the inverse situation. Space isn't collapsing too quickly, it's expanding too quickly, in particular, it's accelerating. And so a particle or a photon or something far away just trying to make it to you is not going to make it uh, to your eyes and you won't observe it because the space between you and the photon is expanding too rapidly. So you'll have uh, an event horizon which now surrounds you. Okay, This is the, the key similarity between black holes and accelerating cosmologies. Right? This event horizon, similar to the black hole event horizon, also has a temperature and an entropy the interpretation of those things is much more confusing in this context, but it shares these similarities with a black hole event horizon. Okay, the fact that it has this temperature and an entropy um, makes you want to ask again, do they obey a central dogma? For example, can you think of the cosmic horizon as just being like an ordinary um, quantum system that evolves unitarily and has some number of microstates? 
this is a kind of much wilder um, conjecture in this context. It was entertained uh, long ago by, by these sets of authors, um, but it's, it's a question you can ask, okay? <clears throat> It's a question you can ask generally about accelerating cosmologies. In this talk, I'll focus on the simplest example, at least at the level of the classical symmetries of the problem, which is De Sitter space. Okay, here I've given the metric of De Sitter space in a particular coordinate system called the static patch coordinate system. And this co coordinate system it kind of looks like you know black hole type metrics. For example, the horizon is manifest set R equals L. And this covers really just a patch of the full De Sitter manifold. And the temperature and entropy as referring to before are given by these formulas. Okay, before I proceed, I should sort of uh, spend a little bit of time on the cautionary tale because I said, oh, accelerating cosmology is similar to black holes. They have an entropy, they have an event horizon with an entropy and a temperature, but there are several things which are very different. And I wanna spend some time talking about those things because I think it's important. Uh, the first and may, maybe one of the most important is that there's very little, uh, if any, agreed upon uh, microscopic support for the Gibbons Hawking entropy of a cosmic horizon. I alluded to earlier there are computations in string theory which reproduce the entropy of certain zero temperature black holes or supersymmetric black holes by counting uh, microstates in a Hilbert space. There are scattered computations trying to do things like this in cosmology, but I think it's fair to say that there's no agreed upon uh, construction or microscopic counting of this entropy, which makes you question whether you should think of it as being some ordinary quantum system with microstates. Okay, another reason they're different is that we think of the black hole horizon uh, as encoding the interior. You can think of this as the original sort of, a, you know, a Beckins, um, a toothed Susskind uh, style of holography or even older, this is how, you know, Wheeler sort of thought, thought about black hole entropy and, you know, how the event horizon encodes the interior or the membrane paradigm. <clears throat> In cosmology though, it's a little confusing. You need to ask which side the cosmological horizon encodes. Okay, naturally, since it's a little inverted, you'd want to say it encodes the exterior, but then it's not clear what encodes the interior. So there are different ways to think about it. That's something that we'll actually talk about a fair amount uh, during this talk. Uh, another issue is that the cosmic horizon is both more universal and more observer dependent than the black hole horizon. So what do I mean by that? The, by more universal, I mean that, oh yeah, question? Yeah, so when you say that the cosmic horizon essentially uh, encodes the physics of the exterior, what exactly do you mean exterior to, to our universe? Uh, the, like, if you remember this picture of us here, when I yeah. say the exterior, I mean, yeah, the region outside the observable horizon. So the region out here. That's sort of the natural analog of like the black hole interior kind of becomes the cosmic exterior. So that's a guess as to what the horizon theory would encode. Okay, but uh, aren't we concerned with what happens in the interior? Yes, yes, but there you might say, well, I can just figure that out by uh, ordinary experiments. Similar to a black hole exterior, you can say, aren't I concerned with what happens in the black hole exterior? Sure, you are, but you can describe, you can use more conventional physics to, to figure that out. The question is, how can I access stuff beyond the region that I can see classically? Okay. Okay, so yeah, when I say the cosmic horizon is more universal, what I mean is if you write down, you know, uh, let's say Einstein gravity with a positive cosmological constant, the sort of vacuum solution of that theory is just the sitter space, which has horizons in it already. You don't need to excite the system to produce horizons. Black holes, in particular black holes in ADS are different. We think of them as excitations above the vacuum. So that's the sense in which cosmic horizons are, are more universal. They're more observer dependent because you know two observers in different parts of uh, De Sitter space or some accelerating cosmology have different notions of an event horizon. Okay, it's an observer dependent notion. With black holes, as long as you, you know you stay outside the black hole, you and your friend will have the same notion of the event horizon of the black hole. If someone jumps in, they'll have a different notion, but as long as you're outside, you'll agree about where the event horizon is. <clears throat> Another key. Um, sort of technical difference is that in a closed universe like the sitter space time, there's no, if you, you know, constrain yourself to a fixed time, there's no asymptotic region where you can assume gravity is getting weak 
and you can ignore the back reaction. In particular, you can't do these constructions of coupling some a holographic CFT to some non-gravitational system and studying it that way. So the back reaction on the system seems to you know, be more, even more important in this case because the universe is closed. It doesn't have asymptotic regions. And finally, I'll just comment on this because I think it's an, it's an interesting uh, puzzle that uh, Adam Levine and I explored recently in a paper. And this comment will be um, maybe a little bit more for the experts. <coughs> you know, the thing we're asking is whether you could encode the region beyond your cosmic horizon. Uh, that's a question you might want to ask. Now, as I said, the cosmic horizon is observer dependent. So if you have two observers, two different places in the universe, and they can each encode the region beyond their cosmic horizon, those regions will overlap. Okay, in particular, the quote entanglement wedges of the regions will overlap. And that's something that never happens in ADS CFT or the study of black holes uh, or any conventional scenario. And there's a good reason it doesn't happen. It'll lead to problems with uh, no cloning and things like that. So this is um, a puzzle related to the kind of naive extension of these ideas to cosmology. Um, okay, and there are lots more uh, things you can talk about in this cautionary tale. Um, I'll leave it at this. I just wanna emphasize that there are difficulties in this analogy. So one has to be careful in particular in its interpretation. Um, but now that I've sort of aired my dirty laundry, I can sort of proceed and uh, ignore some of these issues unless they actually hit me in the face in the computation. So you can ask a question about this issue of overlapping. I didn't understand uh, what the difficulty was. So let's say, uh, I mean, let's say you, you, you have visitor space and you have a hemisphere and now you're asking if you can encode the other half, I mean, the other half of the sphere. Is that, is that a, a reasonable uh, question? I mean, is that a reasonable way to look at your setup? Um, I'm, you can phrase it that way. I'm more thinking of observers which go to like uh, future infinity and you okay. ask about whether they could encode beyond their observable horizons, which are, you know, basically okay. zero size on that conformal okay. diagram. Okay. But I mean, we have that in ADS safety, right? You, you could take two overlapping entanglement wedges and, you know, you have, so you have different parts in the boundary, but they overlap. And then there's some region where the bulk entanglement wedge overlaps and you have to make sure that's consistent. I mean, why is it not similar? No, 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 no. sorry, sorry. In ADS CFT, if you take disconnected regions on the boundary, oh, you'll never disconnected have overlap. Region. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, but uh, is are these are these two observers? Do they have disconnected? I mean, are they ever disconnected? I thought they never disconnected, right? Good, good. Yes. So yeah, in this paper, we study this, models. It, yeah. yeah, we study models where you can, um, as far as we know, the most rig rigorous microscopic description is that you could think of these observers as actually disconnected. They exit nice. into their own non-gravitating regions, and then you can ask this question sharply there. You're right that if they're both in the bulk of the sitter, then you can't really kind of make this split and talk about it reasonably. So you have to do something similar to putting these flat space wings, but now in the sitter space. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Just a clarification. So are you uh, ultimately going to uh, relate your uh, boundary theory to the exterior of the cosmic horizon or? Are you um, to... we'll, we'll get to that. I'm, we'll get to that. I'm going to do two different things during the talk, but we'll, we'll, you'll see. We'll get to it. Because I because, mean, the question is to sorry. Because the exterior uh, exterior is uh, forever uh, beyond our observational capabilities, right? I mean, we can't observe the exterior in any way. So, if you, if you want to suggest, if you want to draw a duality argument, how are you going to kind of map the duality between a region which is on the boundary and a region which is never accessible to us. So I'm thinking of say doing some sort of experiment in some way, which can tell you whether you're on the right track or not. When you say experiment, do you mean like an actual experiment out there? Like our experimentalist friends would do? Or do you mean like a uh, well, let, let me answer your let me answer your question this way. Uh, you can try and probe these ideas, for example, from the following perspective. You can uh, be in a quasi desitter phase for a long time, and then you can exit. For example, as happened in the inflationary era. When that happens, you can look back <clears throat> at the uh, inflationary area, and you can see many different sort of observable patches all in your patch. So, if there are effects at the early times in the quasi desitter phase 
which connect things beyond the horizon to things within the horizon, that may leave an imprint after you exit from the inflationary era, for example. That, that's a way you can try and probe such an idea. And uh, uh, are you saying that the CMB would carry such imprints? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't actually know. I haven't done a computation which shows effects of it on the CMB, but it's actually one of the things that I think is the most exciting uh, thing to think about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me give sort of two pieces of uh, a background and review just to set the stage of what's going to be going on. The first is to speak a little bit about what um, what the ideas are for holography and Sitter space time. Okay, so here's a Sitter Penrose diagram. It's a square. Okay, up here is a conformal boundary. It's future infinity. Down here is past infinity. Each time slice is a sphere. So this is like the north pole of the sphere. There's a south pole of the sphere. These are not conformal boundaries. Space ends here at this vertical line and this vertical line. This horizon is the relevant horizon for some observer who sits here and goes up to infinity. And the antipodal observer who sits here and goes up to this future infinity has this as their observable horizon. These little wedges, uh, you can ignore them. They're, they're um, Bousseau wedges. They're just telling you directions in which, in which um, light sheets are contracting. But uh, you, don't, you can ignore them. Now, there have been sort of three types of proposals for where to, quote, locate the holographic dual theory in the sitter space. The original one, which is the most studied one, is to do something very analogous to ADS-CFT and locate the holographic dual at the conformal boundary or boundaries of the system, which are future and past infinity. And this is known as DS-CFT, okay? There, lots of things have been said about it and things have been computed. Uh, it was many years before any sort of uh, concrete models, um, which were uh, very first in this paper, Anos Hartman and Strominger, and then extended um, in another paper. Uh, it was a long time before any concrete models were written down. And even in these concrete models, it's not clear if the duality um, can capture uh, effects at higher topology and more intricate sorts of things. And the theory of gravity that's described in this concrete duality is a higher spin theory of gravity. It's kind of a mess. Um, but this is one perspective, uh, which is to think about the duality as akin to ADS-CFT and the dual is located at the conformal boundaries. Okay, that's the most studied form. That's actually not what I'm gonna be focused on in this talk. I have a question regarding this Penrose diagram for De Sitter space. As far as I understand, the uh, t equals minus infinity uh, line is supposed to be the Big Bang, right? I mean, uh, it's supposed to give rise to the De Sitter phase to start with, right? So this is pure global De Sitter. I think what you're talking about is what our universe looks like. Yeah, so even even if you have global de Sitter, uh, isn't the metric given by e to the h t times something? And uh, when you take t to minus infinity, isn't it going to shrink to zero? No, the e to the h t you're talking about is um, is the coordinates in this flat patch. That only covers this uh, triangle here. Um, but if you take global de Sitter, it's really a bouncing cosmology. It's infinitely big in the past. Um, it comes to some finite size and grows again. It's a cosh instead of an exponential. So, so for instance, balance. for our specific universe, what sort of uh, region would correspond to that patch? No, in our universe, we don't have any evidence for this patch below. Let me call this line in the middle, t equals zero. We don't have any evidence um, for a region below t equals zero where space-time bounces. I mean, people study it and make claims about it, but we don't have any evidence that supports that we bounced. But here I'm just studying um, this uh, global de Sitter space time, which has a bounce in it. Okay. You could think of it as a theoretical model, the same way we study the eternal black hole or the thermal field double black hole. We don't think that any black holes in our universe are described by the thermal field double. Nevertheless, it's incredibly useful to study that as a model um, and learn things about black holes. Okay, so that's one form of holographic duality. Uh, another proposal that's been made, and you know, uh, different sets of authors have different approaches to it, is to locate the holographic dual near the static patch observer, the person who lives over here. Okay, the motivation for that is that, well, you can, you know, this region, even though it's not a conformal boundary, it's a little bit akin to the ADS boundary in a in a certain sense. If you did conformal transformations, you could map it um, to something like an ADS boundary. 
Or you could imagine embedding the sitter space in something asymptotically ADS. And then as you sort of go out in this region, the space time will change away from the sitter and become asymptotically ADS. So you know the dual would live somewhere out here. Um, and that's why people like to think about it, uh, think about a holographic dual, which lives you know, somewhere here. Okay. And finally, the other idea is to locate the holographic dual on the cosmic horizon. Okay these cosmic horizons that I've drawn here. This was most explored by Banks and Fischler, but uh, various other people have explored this as well. And one comment I want to make is that these two forms of holography are clearly observer dependent. This one explicitly, okay, I said observer in the statement. Uh, and this one almost explicitly, I said you locate the dual near the cosmic horizon, but as we discussed, the horizon is observer dependent itself, okay? So these are observer dependent, um, which is of course different than the usual way we think about holography. Uh, this one is not, but this one kind of requires a meta observer. If you talk about a boundary dual that lives up here, there's no observer who can see all of that. Unless, as I was talking about before, you sort of imagine exiting from inflation and going up here and looking toward the past and seeing this region. Okay, so they both have, all three have these uh, kind of various weirdnesses associated to them. The two forms I'm going to study in this talk are these latter two forms of holography. Okay. Okay, so uh, before you go into that, when you say that the left left uh, axis uh, is kind of the boundary where you want to study the boundary theory, uh, isn't the left axis just the North Pole going? Just yeah, yeah. So the way people imagine it is you kind of regulate it a little bit. You can imagine drilling a little tube around the observer here. And then you think about the degrees of freedom as living on that tube. Or if you want, as I was saying, you imagine um, writing instead an asymptotically ADS spacetime, which has a desitter phase in the interior. And then you think about holography that way. Yeah, but uh, this uh, the, is, isn't that just a point going through time? I mean, going through the time axis. Well, as I said, you drill a tube. So it's not a point, it's now a region. I mean, it's very small. And yeah, indeed, if you think about it that way, you're not really going to think about it as like a field theory that describes the sitter space time. You think about it as some sort of a matrix quantum mechanics or something like that. Oh, okay. I mean, no, there's no particularly sharp proposal for this. Uh, I agree with you. It's a little strange um, to, to do that. It's just an idea that's been explored. I think the sharpest way to explore it is to embed it in asymptotically ADS space time. Okay, let me give one more piece of, of, of background of the tool that I'm gonna be kind of using continuously. And the tool I'm gonna be using is um, how to compute entanglement entropy in, in gravitational systems, okay? And this really comes from ADS CFT, where we learned that you could compute the entanglement entropy of the dual CFT by extremizing a particular quantity, okay? So we wanna compute minus trace rho log rho. And the density matrix we wanna consider is the reduced density matrix of the CFT, let's say within this dashed uh, circular region. Okay, so the density matrix here. Um, that's given to you by extremizing something we call the generalized entropy. Okay, the generalized entropy is the area of this pink surface, which is anchored to this region here, plus the entropy of matter within this pink region. Okay, so you add those two things together you extremize it, meaning you vary um, the sort of shape of this pink surface until you hit an extremum. Uh, and that gives for you the entropy of the CFT. Okay, this has been developed over almost 20 years now. Now, there are two pieces of uh, uh, physics that come with this. One is the notion of entanglement wedge reconstruction. Uh, which gives you a way of thinking about subregion duality in ADS CFT. So, you know, originally ADS CFT, we talked about an entire CFT being dual to an entire uh, bulk string theory. But there's uh, a way using, you know, tools from quantum information to think about uh, the data of subregions and how those things are dual. In particular, what it says is that the entanglement wedge, which is defined as the region within this pink surface in the bulk, uh, the data there is dual to or can be reconstructed by the data within this um, uh, dashed circular region here. That statement has some, some uh, you know, additional caveats and, and, and fine, um, fine print, uh, but roughly speaking, that's what it's saying. You can think about the data here being dual to the data within this pink region here. And if that's true, 
then there's a sort of very simple consistency principle that has to be true, which is if I increase the size of this dash circular region, then the pink region had better grow as well. Because if I access more of the data of my microscopic description, I'd better be able to access more of the data of the bulk description. Okay, that's called entanglement wedge nesting. So these pink regions have to be nested within each other as this dash circular region grows. Okay, that's a basic consistency principle of this paradigm. All right, I think I've given all the background I want to give. So now I can um, go into some, some computations um, where I can you know, give some details about the computations, but mostly I'll outline uh, what the answers look like. So in the first uh, part of the talk, I'm going to be thinking about holographic duality from this perspective of uh, locating the dual like near the static patch observer or something like that. And the analogy I'm going to be using is something that hasn't escaped anyone who's thought about De Sitter spacetime, which is that the Penrose diagram for De Sitter spacetime is a square and looks like the Penrose diagram for the eternal black hole in ADS, okay, which is drawn here. Now, the Penrose diagrams being the same just means that the causal structure is the same. The geometries are totally different, right? Okay. In the black hole context, uh, we're able to make some progress by appending to this Penrose diagram these flat space regions. Okay, so this is the ADS boundary here and here. Um, you know, gravity is getting weak as you go out here, as you get far away from the black hole. So you can sort of consistently append these flat space regions uh, to the Penrose diagram, where you imagine gravity is shut off. You completely ignore the effects of gravity out here. That's why I've drawn it in gray. Okay. Now, you can't really do that in De Sitter spacetime. This was the one of the caveats I gave in my cautionary tale because this is just the North Pole of the sphere. But you can do something which uh, sounds a little ad hoc, but um, I'll talk about why you shouldn't worry about it too much, which is you just drill out some regions, you regulate it at some finite radius, and you declare that you're going to ignore the effects of gravity within here. Okay. As I said, this is weird. There isn't really a reason to expect that gravity is weak around here. But this is meant as a mock-up for something that uh, is more consistent, which is to embed De Sitter space in something like asymptotically ADS spacetime, and then put on these flat space regions uh, at the ADS boundaries. Okay, I mean, when you do that, there are certain things that happen. The De Sitter region ends up behind a black hole. But uh, suffice it to say, you can write down such, uh, such geometries. Um, and what I'm going to say in this context will apply to those cases. Here, I'm just going to use this as a heuristic to kind of quickly get to the punchline. Sorry, just a quick question. Are you saying yeah. you are mapping De Sitter space to something which is asymptotically ADS? No. Um, you mean this arrow here? No, no. Uh, what is the st exact statement with the relationship between De Sitter space and uh, the asymptotically ADS mapping that you're doing? I'm not sorry. I, I, I'm using ADS in two cases here in this picture. The ADS case is just an analogy to tell me what to do in the De Sitter case. The words I was just saying okay. um, about embedding De Sitter space and asymptotic the ADS is just a way to think about making this construction more rigorous, where you ignore the effects of gravity uh, far from the cosmic horizon. I'm not actually going to do it that way. What I'm actually going to do is just ignore the effects of gravity in this region in De Sitter space time. That's what I'm actually going to do. Um, yeah. Oh. OK, so I, I make so in this case, we understand what the holographic dual of the system is. The thermal field double black hole is given by an entangled pair of quantum systems. We've appended these flat space regions. And there's some field theory that lives throughout the space time, including in the red region where gravity is dynamical and the gray region where it's not. Um, and that in the holographic dual of this entire space time, you have the semi-infinite regions where that CFT lives. So this semi-infinite region here is like the semi-infinite region here. And this quantum system has some interactions with the higher dimensional field theory in the semi-infinite region. And this entire system is in the thermal field double state with this entire system. Okay, that's what the holographic dual of this uh, geometry is. Now, okay, we don't know what holography with the space time is supposed to look like, uh, but we'll use this assumption of locating the dual near the static patch observers and then you get a somewhat similar picture. You have some quantum systems, a pair of quantum systems, which describe the geometry in here. And now you don't have semi-infinite regions. You have these finite regions, because these gray regions are finite. 
And the system here interacts with the system here, and it's in some entangled state, maybe even interacting with this other system over here. Okay. So that's that's the assumption of this setup or other setups like this, where you might embed it in asymptotically ADS space time. So Edgar, is there a slightly better, I mean, um, justification for this assumption? Because I'm worried that you know this assumption might, uh, you know, if if it's not true, it might later influence the results that we get. Um, uh, so not, yeah, I can see how you get the picture. Yeah, okay. exactly. So you're assuming there's a dual on that world line, right? So if I think of that world line, you're assuming there's a dual theory, and the rest of it is some non-gravitational part, which I can just do consistently. I mean, isn't that yeah, a strong I, assumption? Or I, I think the best way to set this up is to embed this in asymptotically ADS space time. That, that, that's the uh, real way I know how to make this rigorous. Um, I agree with you in this context, there isn't really a reason to, to believe that this uh, is correct, but maybe I'm going to get to the conclusion of this uh, construction in like one or two slides. So maybe when I get there, you can ask again if you're, if you're bothered by the conclusion. I think the conclusion is more universal than this, okay, thank you. Than this weird construction. Okay, um, thank you. I, I, okay. Have, I, have a, I have a question. I mean, yes. why do this at all? I mean, uh, if, if you have just the world line of, a, of the North Pole going from minus infinity to infinity, uh, that itself is kind of like a, a zero dimensional model, right? I mean, it can be, it can carry degrees of freedom, which can indeed uh, give, give rise to the dual gravitational picture, just as say the SYK model gives rise to the black holes in in the JT gravity SYK duality picture. Sorry, what's the question? The question is, why not work? Why why deform the world line to this specific deformed world line which you have done? And why not work with the original world line itself, which goes from minus infinity to infinity, and say that the dual theory lives on this world line, which is a zero plus one dimensional field theory. Ah, good. Uh, you're, you're, you're saying, why did I even introduce these regions? I could have yeah, just yeah, taken yeah, yeah, this yeah. pair of quantum systems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. You, you'll, you'll see why I did it in, in, in the slide. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to use these regions. Oh. I mean, to say it another way, if if you did a, if you if you're okay with that assumption that you can have a, a world line quantum system or a pair of world line quantum systems that are dual to the bulk, then I'm allowed to couple those world line quantum systems to some additional system and put some interactions there. That's something I'm allowed to do. Now I don't know if that is going to course. You know how I do that will determine what the new geometry is going to look like, but I'm I'm definitely allowed to couple it to some other system, and 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 I want to do that. Because in this case, it was useful. Here you could have asked, why did I append these flat space regions? I already have the holographic dual of the space time. But it was actually very useful to do that for certain computations. And here we're going to see that it's useful to learn the lesson that I want to learn. Oh. OK. So in this context, um, I mean, you didn't really need these flat space regions, but uh, it's true there as well. We know that the black hole entropy, the area of this um, bifurcate horizon here, corresponds to an entanglement entropy between the two systems. Okay, so these microscopic pictures are helpful because I always find it very helpful when computing entropies and gravity to say precisely what entropy you're calculating. And in cases where you have a microscopic dual, it's very clear how to do that. So this you know, x and this x and this region here say denote the fact that I want to compute the entropy of the entire right system including this quantum system at, at the um, endpoint of the CFT, OK? Now, the way you do that, uh, using um, this Ryu Takenagi rule that I was talking about earlier, computing entanglement entropy in ADS CFT, is you basically extremize the left endpoint of this system in the bulk, OK? This endpoint here is at infinity. It just sits right there. But this endpoint is in the gravitational system. So you extremize the generalized entropy with respect to a location of this point. Okay, this point is, of course, a D minus two sphere because we're this is a let's say D dimensional ADS space time. And by the symmetries of the problem, that's just going to land on the bifurcate horizon of the black hole. Okay, and you pick up that area, okay, plus the matter entropy in here. But basically, the black hole entropy or the generalized entropy is interpreted as an entanglement entropy 
between the two sides, between this side and this side. OK, at first glance, the de Sitter computation looks symmetric. It looks good. We get the same answer. If we compute the entropy of the entire right system, you can do the same sort of extremization where you extremize the left uh, endpoint, and you'll land on this uh, de Sitter bifurcate horizon. So it seems at first that you can also interpret the de Sitter entropy as an entanglement entropy between these two sides. OK, that's a statement people have made in the past as a way to think about the de Sitter entropy. Uh, so that's good. We, we recover that result. But this is where these gray regions are going to come into play. Uh, there's a problem with this result. OK, the way to see the problem is to first do a more general computation in the black hole case where instead of taking the entire quantum system, um, you take some of it. So you still include the red quantum system, but you only take some of um, the higher dimensional field theory it's interacting with. OK, so that corresponds to the right endpoint being somewhere here. OK, by entanglement wedge nesting, because we took a smaller region, our entanglement wedge should be a smaller region of the bulk. And indeed, that's what happens. When you do the extremization again, you see that the left endpoint moves to the right. So the entanglement wedge shrank because you shrank the region of the microscopic description you're looking at. All right, that's, that's totally consistent. These are believed to be correct answers. In de Sitter space, however, the opposite occurs. If I shrink the region whose entropy I'm computing, so I bring in the right endpoint and put it here, the left endpoint moves to the left. So my entanglement wedge gets larger when I probe less of the microscopic description. Okay. This, this is wrong. This is inconsistent. Okay, so somewhere, somewhere we went wrong. If we believe that the holographic dual looks like this and we believe in entanglement wedge reconstruction, as I discussed, then entanglement wedges need to shrink as you shrink the region in the microscopic description. All right. So, okay, what, what went wrong? It's very natural to ask that. Well, you can say that this picture of holography is just incorrect, but actually, um, there's, um, well, I don't know if it's subtle, but there, there's a kind of underexplored reason why this went wrong. And it's because this extremum I was talking about is actually very different from this extremum. When we do entanglement entropy computations in ADS CFT, we often say that we look for an extremum of the area functional or an extremum of the generalized entropy functional. But extrema come in very many varieties, right? Okay, the derivatives have to vanish, um, but you can ask about the second derivatives, what those look like. And it turns out when you do entanglement entropy computations, you really want the extrema to be what are called maxi min surfaces. Okay, these uh, correspond to the fact that the surface should be a maximum in time and a minimum in space. Okay, um, in the black hole case, it's sort of clear to see, for example, um, in this picture, why this surface is a maximum in time and a minimum in space. Okay, space is collapsing here and here, so it's getting very small, and it's biggest basically right in the middle, so it's a maximum in time. And it's a minimum in space because this is a wormhole connecting these two sides. You know, the wormhole is kind of big at the ends and then shrinks down to a small waist. So it's a minimum in space. The center space is exactly the opposite, right? I said it's infinitely big in the past and infinitely big in the future and it has a waist at t equals zero, it's minimized. So it's a minimum in time. And actually it's a maximum in space. You could think of this as like a great circle on the sphere, okay? So it's not, uh, maxi min surface, which are the types of surfaces we like in computations of entanglement entropy. Uh, it's what I call a mini max surface, which actually has not really been interpreted in the ADS CFT dictionary. I think it's an interesting question to ask what does this you know, geometrically well defined surface uh, correspond to? But in particular, it doesn't seem to correspond to entropy because if you use such a surface for entropy, you'll run into this problem that you'll violate entanglement wedge nesting. Okay. That's sort of uh, lesson one of the, of the first part of this talk, that even though you know, the sitter space and black holes both have event horizons with a temperature and an entropy, the geometric nature of that surface is, is actually different. And it seems to preclude it from being used in entanglement entropy computations. All right, so I'll pause there for a second in case there are any questions. Uh, so, so I, I mean, I, I agree with this conclusion, but I wanted to ask, I mean, well, is there a replicatrix derivation of this formula at all in this case? I mean, this is your, the first hypothesis you mentioned about whether the, the prescription makes sense. Um, 
I mean, let's say I just wanted to justify the formula. So we can ask for this maximum or minimax, but I mean, is it, is, it, is it clear the formula itself is justified? Yeah, I think if you, well, if you allow yourself to freeze these regions, then yeah. I think you can do the same sort of thing because, okay, I mean, how does the replica trick derivation really work? You declare some equivalence of uh, partition functions of bulk and boundary. So I've made some assumption of what my boundary system looks like. Um, and then if you have some frozen region, then you're allowed to replicate that. Um, yeah. That's the thing that you replicate in the derivation. And then, okay, I haven't dotted the I's and crossed the T's, but I think it'll go through in the same way that it goes through for like the derivation in ADS CFT. I see, I mean, somewhere there's some, some assumption of holography there and, and you're saying we'll just assume that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I see, okay, okay, thanks, yeah. Uh, sorry, can I ask one more question? In the case where you took the entire region uh, and you got the horizon, I mean, is that a, a maximum surface? Um, no, this, case, this, yeah. one, this is a minimax yeah. surface. This is also a minimax surface. So this, so this, I mean, this is just a deceptively correct computation of the entropy. You're saying this is not, even this should not be interpreted as an entropy. Correct, yeah. I, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, and it's a little bit simple to see what the quote correct answer is supposed to be. Uh, you pick this Cauchy slice, which is reasonable because it's a t equals zero slice, and you really you want to minimize on that t equals zero slice. Okay, if you minimize, this endpoint is going to want to shrink all the way here. It really wants to shrink and vanish, as it would in a fully fluctuating space time, but it can't because of these boundary conditions, and so it'll sort of sit there. The degenerate, there's some degenerate uh, extremal surface which wants to sit right there. That's sort of the correct answer in this in this problem, but it's not a very useful answer because it's cutoff dependent. I mean, I made up. Uh, where I'm uh, making the space time non dynamical here. Okay, but but this this is not good Hello? because yeah. yeah can, I, can I ask a question? So, I mean, in what sense do we even can talk about entanglement page and so on and so forth in this uh, context? Like, um, do you expect that there's something like a sub region duality and so on? I mean, there's, there's a world line, right? I mean, um, um, yeah, I mean, it, so again, in this construction, I've appended these, these sort of gray regions. So I am assuming the structure of holography and the structure of entanglement wedge reconstruction. I mean, that's a lot to assume. If either of those things is not, well, if holography is not true, I don't even know what entropy I'm, compute, I'm computing here. So I need that to even compute something. Um, if entanglement wedge reconstruction is not true, then yeah, there isn't necessarily a problem here. If this is just a uh, algorithm which produces for you an entropy, um, but somehow the structure of entanglement wedge reconstruction uh, fails or breaks, then there won't necessarily be a problem here. But I don't really think that that can happen, that you can be computing entropies consistently in this framework, yet the entanglement wedge uh, reconstruction uh, fails because those two things are closely related. Uh, right, okay. Uh... I have a comment to make regarding this. Maybe the thing is that when you deform the world line and it and it goes inside uh, the Penrose diagram, what it means is that it's no longer a world line, but it uh, because the individual points inside the Penrose diagram are spheres, right? And they are, they are not points. So once you deform the world line, it becomes a kind of a space time instead of just a world line. Maybe yeah. So doesn't that resolve the problem? Um, I don't think so. Why do you say it resolves the problem? Because entanglement wedges and things of that sort, uh, things of that kind are supposed to arise in when you have a bulk, when you have a when you have a bulk space time. And but here's uh, the bulk space time. It's in red. Yeah, but uh, when you have when you are talking about the boundary, if the boundary is just a world line, then and and as opposed to when it's not a world line but a space time with, uh, with which is which is a finite dimensional. Uh, I mean, which is which is three plus one dimensional instead of zero plus one dimensional, then. Things will be different from when it's just a zero plus one dimensional theory, right? 
I think the details of the dimensionality of the boundary theory are not actually very important here. So let me just phrase it in the following way. Again, assume that I embedded this in asymptotically ADS spacetime. Okay, and then I did a computation from that ADS boundary coupled to some flat space region. And then I very obviously see some extremal surface here, which I want to use in an, in an entanglement entropy computation. You might be tempted to use it. Okay, in that context, uh, the rules are clear. And if you used it, you would get the wrong answers. You would violate entanglement wedge nesting. It would be wrong. Um, and it's wrong because the nature of the surface is different than the nature of this surface. So it actually shouldn't be used in such computations. There, you don't need, there we know what the boundary dimensionality is going to be, and we won't run into this confusion. I think here it's not a problem either. You're right that you need to be a little careful. Is this red quantum system now the same dimensionality as the sphere here, or is it zero plus one dimensional? I, I agree that I haven't specified that, but I think in this computation, it's actually not important. Um, you just ask about the entropy of a subset of the system, and the rule for computing that will be something like this, and you'll run into this problem even there. Uh, sorry, can um, I ask the question? Um, yeah. uh, why is why is embedding this in an asymptotically ADS space time give you this picture where you have this gray region with no gravity? Uh, no, it doesn't quite. So what I mean is, um, um, forget about this gray region for now. You have Sitter space time, but you have like a scalar field or something that's running so that at some radius, let's say around here, the space time deforms um, and goes to something that's asymptotically ADS. And now when you have these ADS boundaries, you can append non-gravitating uh, flat space regions to those, similar to what you do over here. And this gray region in this analogy will correspond to that gray region um, in that space time. And then you can ask about entropies from that perspective, ADS boundary coupled to the bath. And if you tried to use the desider extremum that lives in the middle, uh, you would run into problems. I see, but, but that that picture seems a little different from the picture you're drawing, right? Where the, yeah, 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 no, the geometry the that's going to look different. All I mean is, but morally, it's, it's similar to this computation. The same thing would happen. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so uh, this is not a great conclusion because we want to interpret the Desider entropy. Uh, at least some of us would like to interpret the Desider entropy as actually an entanglement entropy between you know what's inside and what's outside. That would be a nice answer to get. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to change the rules of the problem a little bit. I'm going to think about holography as um, you know uh, locating the dual on the cosmic horizon itself, and the answers I get from that perspective seem to allow us to interpret it that way. Okay, so that's that's what I'm going to move on to next. All right, so this was the third form of holography in my kind of three versions that I was talking about that people have explored. So the first question you need to ask right away is which side of the horizon is encoded? We discussed this a little bit already. It's a little funny because in ADS CFT, for example, you have the ADS boundary and the CFT that lives at the boundary encodes the bulk. There's only one side of the ADS boundary, okay? Um, so there's no sort of confusion as to which side's encoded, but the horizon lives in the middle of the space time. Um, so you can ask, which side is this dual theory encoding? And uh, well, this thing about space-time only existing to one side, the ADS horizon, is actually a bit of a red herring, OK? There are constructions you can study, uh, and people have studied, including people in this audience, which look like the following. So here again, I've drawn the picture that we've seen, the thermal field double black hole in ADS with some flat space non-dynamical regions. Here's the microscopic description, OK? Now, from the microscopic perspective, you can actually change the model. Instead of having these semi-infinite higher dimensional theories, you can make them uh, finite and cap them off with another holographic quantum system, which I've denoted by the color blue, uh, because these blue quantum systems are dual to another ADS uh, region, which is um, colored in blue here. The Penrose diagram now is periodically identified. So this vertical line is identified with this vertical line. And this is the bulk dual of this microscopic picture. And these finite regions are now these finite regions here, OK? But now it's clear what you can do uh, in this picture. You can take a limit where this finite region shrinks to zero size, OK? In that case, the red and blue will sit on top of each other and make purple. So you'll have some self-interacting quantum system in a thermal field double state with another copy of itself. 
And now this finite region is going to shrink to zero size. You're going to have something like an ADS boundary, and it's going to have space time to both sides of it. OK? In this picture, uh, we know what the prescription is for computing um, entanglement entropy. The prescription is to find extremal surfaces on both sides of the ADS boundary. All right? In this picture, you can ask more refined questions, which will pick out surfaces on one or the other side. But if you only have access to this picture, um, then you can only kind of split it symmetrically, such that the answer for entropies will be to find extremal surfaces on both sides of the boundaries. I want to think about the sitter space in basically exactly the same way. Okay, instead of the ADS boundaries, I have these cosmic horizons. All right, I could think of a global time slice. Let's say this one. That's just a sphere. You have the left horizon and the right horizon. So this is the way it's drawn. This is three-dimensional the sitter space, but that's just because that's easy to draw. And you have the regions which I've labeled: the exterior region here, and then the left interior and the right interior. And just as a visual aid, there's nothing going on here. You can kind of break it up just to think of these three different regions, because I'm going to be doing extremization separately in each region. So often I'll break it up as a visual aid. Nothing is really happening here. OK, the way I've been presenting it, um, I have, I'm, I've been arguing that you want to find extremal surfaces on both sides of the horizon. If you want to compute an entropy of H left, you find extremal surface in the left interior and in the exterior. Okay, in a paper that Lenny Susskind and I wrote together, we call this the bilayer proposal uh, because of some, uh, the language just comes from the bit thread reformulation of uh, entropy computations, but it's just a name. And um, uh, Lenny Susskind separately had a, a proposal for computing entanglement entropy in this context, which we call the monolayer proposal, which says that you should only find extremal surfaces in this exterior region. You should actually never extremize in these interior regions. OK. And what I want to do in the next part of the talk is apply these two um, prescriptions and compute uh, a, a few things to kind of compare and contrast. So the simplest thing to compute, and I'll do this from the bilayer perspective first, is to compute the entropy of the left horizon, OK? The entire left horizon. So what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to extremize to the left interior. Well, the correct extremal surface there is a trivial one. You could imagine dynamically starting off with a circle that sits on the left horizon and then minimizing it. It's just going to shrink and slip off here and give you zero area. When you extremize to the exterior, the area is getting bigger in this direction. So it's actually not going to want to go out. It's just going to want to sit right on the horizon itself. So you'll recover that the entropy of the horizon is the area of the horizon divided by 4 G Newton. And the entanglement wedge, which is the region between the two extremal surfaces, the trivial one that kind of sits at the tip, and this one here, is the interior. <clears throat> and this extremization prescription, you can actually formulate it as a maxi-min prescription. There's a way, even though we're talking about the same geometric surface, to think about this as a maximum in time and a minimum in space. There's a maxi-min formulation you can write down. I mean, we only care about that because we don't want to run into problems with entanglement wedge nesting. So another way to say it is, in all these computations I'm going to do, you'll see explicitly there's no issue with entanglement wedge nesting Okay, when things are phrased in this way. So that's good. I mean, we expect that the uh, one of the two horizon theories can't encode the exterior on its own. It's like, you know, it would be as if the left CFT and ADS CFT encoded the black hole interior on its own. It can't. But it does encode uh, the left interior. Okay. And the entropy comes out to be this formula that we like. It's the gibbons hawking entropy. We can also compute the entropy of the union of the two horizon theories. Now, we also need to extremize the right horizon to the right interior, but that's symmetric with the computation of the left horizon to the left interior. It gives you zero. And now when you extremize in between, um, I mean, the dynamical way to think about it is you have these two circles, and they can come together and annihilate. Or you just think about it from the point of view of extremal surfaces and the homology constraint. The trivial surface is an allowed extremal surface. And it's the minimal one in this case. And what you find is the entanglement wedge is the entire shaded blue region. And the entropy is 0. Okay, That's also consistent with what we expect. I mean, I'm declaring that the full microscopic description is the union of the two horizon theories. If that's true, then the entanglement wedge has to be the entire space-time, because it's dual to the entire space-time. 
This is exactly like doing the computation here of the entropy of the left purple dot and the right purple dot. What you would find when you extremize in the red and blue regions is the trivial extremal surfaces in both cases and S equals zero because it's in a pure state overall. Just like the black hole case, you know, the entropy of the sitter space we think of as an entropy, not of the global state, but of like a static patch when you trace out some of the space time. That's what we think the entropy is coming from. That's why the global state has no entropy. Okay. This is just a basic consistency check on this proposal. People, for example, had tried to compute entropies by anchoring surfaces to the horizon in the past, um, but they, you know, the rules that are kind of more natural to use or seem natural at the time didn't actually give you these sorts of answers. Um, so this, I think, is a is a good consistency check that at least it's not uh, obviously wrong. And the monolayer proposal, you know, if you extremize only in between the horizons, just gives the same answers for the entropies. That's because every time I extremize to the left interior to the interior regions, I got zero. That never contributed the answer. Contributed to the answer. The only thing in these two computations that contributed to the answer was this surface here, which had to do with the extremization in the exterior region. So, so far, these two answers seem the same. Okay, any questions about that? That's sort of the most basic computation we can do. So you're now going to ask what happens if you take like part of the horizon? Is, is that the, like rather than taking the full equator, if you take half of the equator, is that what you're going to do? Good, I'm good. That's going to be the next calculation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In the interest of time, I'll skip um, what was actually the next computation. You can repeat this for a Schwarzschild black hole in De Sitter space time. Okay. The Penrose diagram is a little funny. The topology is different. A time slice of the topology has a wormhole because you have entangled black holes. You could compute the entropy of the entire left horizon or the union of the two horizons. You get reasonable answers again with reasonable entanglement wedges. And the monolayer and bilayer theories agree in this case as well. I'm going to jump past this case uh, just in the interest of time and go to the computation, which I think is interesting, which is the one uh, Sura just asked about, which is to consider a subregion on one of the horizons. Okay, and I should say a little, um, give a little bit of a warning. It's unclear if this is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, um, you know, of course, in ADS CFT, we could consider subregions of the CFT, but in the case of the sitter space, it's sort of expected that the theory that quote lives on the horizon doesn't have any spatial locality on the horizon. For example, it's probably not even the same dimensionality as the horizon. It's probably just a zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics. I mean, we don't really know, um, but because we don't really know, it's unclear if taking subregions of the horizon makes sense. It's a little bit like trying to chop up the internal space in ADS CFT, which people have thought about and uh, made conjectures about, but is, is still not well understood. But let's do it because it's interesting. And I'm just going to assume it corresponds to some division of the holographic dual system, not necessarily geometrically, could be some other division. And something interesting happens when you do that. So first I'll compute from the bilayer perspective. Um, and let's say this red region is the subregion of the horizon I'm considering. Now it turns out, uh, this picture is actually a very bad picture to see this, but it's true. Uh, when you extremize to the interior or to the exterior, the surface is not going to want to go anywhere. It's just going to sit right on the horizon. Okay. So what will happen is you'll get two times the area of the subregion you're considering. One factor from the interior extremization, one factor from the exterior extremization. And what that means is this central dogma, which is an idea we've been exploring. In other words, can you think of the horizon theory as being a quantum system with a finite dimensional Hilbert space given by you know, e to the area over 4G Newton number of states, uh, that thing looks like it's about to be violated. The entropy looks like it's going to exceed the area divided by 4G Newton at the halfway point, because you'll have two copies of half the horizon. Okay, this is a little bit similar uh, to the um, entropy crisis and Hawking radiation of, of black holes. The entropy of the radiation seems like it's going to exceed uh, the entropy of the black hole. And if they're just entangled quantum systems, that can't happen. Similar to black holes, right when you're about to violate this bound, a uh, phase transition happens. The interior surface, right after the halfway point, it's actually more beneficial for it to flip around and hug the other part of the horizon, okay? The complement restricted to the horizon. 
And as soon as it does that, the area of the interior externalization plus the exterior externalization equals just the area of the horizon. So you saturate at the sort of most entropy you could possibly have, and then you just sit there as the region grows. Okay. I like to think of this heuristically as an island-like transition. You go from encoding none of the interior up here, um, and when you encode none of the interior, you uh, are about to run into a problem with entropy bounds. And then a phase transition happens at the kind of last possible second it can, such that the entanglement wedge becomes the entire interior and the entropy saturates at the most that you can have. And then it stays there. Okay, so, so sorry, is this the statement that you can you, you do not even need the full horizon to encode the interior, you can get away with half the horizon? So the holography dual can live on half the horizon? That seems to be the statement here, yeah. Which I think, if it's correct, is related to sort of how non-local this, this theory is. I'll give an analogy which will make it a little less surprising in the next slide. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is interesting. I mean, the physics of it, if it's correct, is totally different than the physics of islands because that has to do with Hawking radiation. I'm not measuring the entropy of Hawking radiation or anything like that here, but I find it uh, compelling that it has a similarity. But you might worry that this curve is a little crazy. You know, we think of the sitter space as a thermal system. This is not a thermal entropy curve. Thermal entropy curves are extensive as a function of subsystem size. If you had that worry, you would be relieved um, by the fact that the monolayer theory gives you an extensive looking entropy curve. Okay. Why does it do that? Well, you ignore the interior extremization in the monolayer proposal. You only have this surface here. And this surface here just grows at the same rate as the fraction of the horizon. So that thing only taps out the thermal entropy once you have the entire system. Okay. Um, and this is, you know, an ordinary extensive thermal entropy curve. Okay, now this example is nice because it distinguishes these two cases, the bilayer and monolayer curves. And to get a little bit more understanding on which of these um, is possibly correct, I wanna talk a little bit about whether we really think about the sitter space as a thermal system or not. And I think a key point to remember is that the large end limit is similar to, but not the same as an ordinary thermodynamic or large volume limit. Okay, we often speak about them interchangeably in the context of ADS-CFT. We talk about black holes above the Hawking page transition as thermal states, but they're not thermal in the traditional large volume sense. Um, okay, I spent a fair amount of time in my life confused about these sorts of things. And the way I like to think about it now is that holographic CFTs actually have, you know, tend to come equipped with high, certain higher form symmetries, uh, in particular center symmetry, like in N equals four super Yang mills. Um, such that the pattern of the breaking of the symmetry makes the theory behave as if it's in the thermodynamic limit a lot of the time. Okay, one way to see that is this thing that in one plus one dimensional CFTs has been called the extended range of validity of the Cardi formula, but it's a true statement about general holographic, general dimensional holographic CFTs compactified on a torus, let's say. And what it says is once you're above the Hawking page phase transition, when you've compactified the theory on a torus, the entropy is immediately extensive, okay? Which is a little surprising at first glance. You can have all sorts of sub-extensive corrections because you have dimensionless um, combination of lengths. You have the temperature and you have the length scales of the torus. So those could have been here, been in here as sub-extensive corrections. Uh, for example, in the critical vector model, they're there, okay? Um, but in holographic CFTs, ones that are dual to an Einstein-like theory of gravity, they're not there, okay? And one way to understand them is through this higher form symmetry breaking. So, and you know, this is just one observable. You can also compute correlation functions and you see that they don't have sort of non-trivial finite size corrections. So they act as if they're in the thermodynamic limit. But there are other things you could compute which will clearly tell you you're not in the thermodynamic limit. For example, let's compute the entropy of a subregion in ADS-CFT where we have a black hole in the bulk. So let's say we're in the thermal field double and this is one of the two boundary systems. The entropy for small region sizes, it just picks up the UV answer. It doesn't really see this black hole. As you make it bigger, it starts feeling the black hole more and more. And then at an order one fraction of the system size, there's a phase transition, okay? The surface disconnects into a union of this surface and one that hugs the horizon. It has to do this because of the homology constraint, okay? That's why you need these two pieces. 
And then it just stays there. This surface stays there. And as you make the region bigger and bigger, this surface just shrinks to zero size. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that even in the black hole context, there's a phase transition that happens in order one fraction of the system size. And this is not an extensive entropy curve. You sort of tap out the thermal entropy of the system right around here. You don't need to consider the entire system. Okay, the, the thermal entry kind of goes up and up and then kind of decreases and comes back down. In this case, you have to regulate it because it's UV divergent and, and compute some finite stuff. But the fact that you tap out the thermal entropy at an order one fraction of the system size is invariant. And the way you'd see how you'd recover a traditional extensive entropy curve is to take the thermodynamic or large volume limit. In a CFT, that's the same as the infinite temperature limit. That corresponds to this black hole becoming very, very large and sitting very close to the boundary of the ADS space time. And then this transition is pushed to arbitrarily late times. And the surfaces immediately sort of hug the horizon. So it just grows basically with a fraction of the system size. So this is a simple quote observable, which clearly tells you you're not in the thermodynamic limit just because you're at large end in a holographic CFT, even though some other observables look like they're in that limit. And De Sitter space, I think, is similar to this sorry, case. Sorry, sorry, there's something I yeah. didn't understand. Uh, well, why do you, I mean, this is just a finite volume effect, the one you just described, right? I mean, uh, wh why do you say it has to do with large N? This is just the fact that as you take more than half the system, you, you know, it's clear that the entropy it, will not yeah, be- Yeah, it's a, it's a finite volume effect. But what I was saying earlier is that these large N systems, even at finite volume, spit out answers that don't have finite volume corrections. For example, this entropy that I was just talking about is extensive uh -huh. even at an order one temperature. So all I, I was see. saying is that there, these holographic CFTs are good at mimicking the large volume limit and it has to do with large N and higher form symmetries, but they're not great. As you said, you can compute the simple thing and then you do see a finite volume effect. Okay, 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 okay thank you. Yeah. And, and the, the case of De Sitter, I like to think is analogous to that, that this is something like a finite volume effect. You, tap out the thermal entropy of the system, again, at an order one fraction of the system size. In this case, it's exactly half. In this case, it was more than half. But um, morally, I think uh, the two are similar. OK. So I'm almost done. Um, sorry for, for going over time. Uh, but no, I, I no saw from YouTube that there's a rich tradition of uh, <laughs> long talks in this series, but I'm almost done. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Please feel free to take as much time as you want. To, thank you. Thank to you. No, I, I just have basically one more slide and then I'll summarize. So, so here I was just trying to, um, by analogy, argue that this curve, which doesn't look extensive, um, may still be correct and is very similar to thermal entropy curves in ordinary thermal systems that aren't at infinite temperature. And De Sitter space, um, well, it's unclear if it's at infinite temperature or not, but it doesn't seem to obviously be at infinite temperature. You know, the, end, the temperature of the city space is classically computed is an order one temperature. I see. So, so, sorry, I have a question here. Maybe I should have asked earlier. Uh, what if you took uh, half of HL and half of HR? I mean, what's the answer then? Uh, well, I yeah, you can compute it. It's um, you find you find a transition similar to the hartmann maldacena type thing. You can have these new connected surfaces now, which cut across, and there's a competition between those and the disconnected ones. Um, you never really violate the central dogma or anything. Like it doesn't really inform this question at all. It's an interesting I computation because the competition is slightly different as I the black hole case, but it's a similar structure. But you don't get zero. Like you would have got zero for HL union HR. You don't get zero for half of HL union half. Of HR. Correct. Correct. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But but it's still true that the entanglement wedge is everything is whole interior, but the entropy is not zero. Uh, if you take is half that... of HL and half of HR, right? No, no, you'll miss some of the exterior. Uh, me... I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're in the right. Sorry, sorry. It, it, sorry. It can be that. It can be what you said. Yeah. It depends on. It depends on what time you do it at. Because you know, as you go up in time along the horizon, it's going to be costly to go through the bulk because uh, the area is very large there. And then at some point, yeah, you can disconnect and cover the entire bulk, but have a non-zero entropy. That's right. That can occur. I see. Well, why is that consistent? I mean, if you have the entire bulk, why, why does it make sense to have a non-zero entropy? Um, yeah, good. Um, well, 
It's a little, yeah. I mean, you you sort of could have asked the same question here, I guess. <laughs> Why did I get a non-zero entropy when I had none of the bulk? Um, it, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the actual answer to that question is. I think that really, if you want to do these compute, well, you don't have to, but often I think about doing these computations by regulating the horizon a little bit. And then they don't sit right on the horizon. As you increase the region size, they kind of creep in a tiny bit. So I, so I don't think this technically corresponds to none of the bulk. I think it corresponds to like a tiny sliver of the bulk is maybe a way to think about it. And that's why you get an entropy. Um, conversely, in the case where you cover the entire bulk, you don't cover really the entire bulk. You sort of miss a tiny sliver near the horizon. Uh, and you would expect some UV divergent answer. answer no? In that case, I mean, you'd, you'd expect some cutoff dependent answer, but you wouldn't expect to get zero or something. I mean, if it was what you said, wouldn't you expect there was some cutoff dependent Well, when you answer? compute the generalized entropy, I would expect if you have a sliver that you would get a finite answer from, you know, the area would have its divergence, the matter entropy would be UV divergence, and the combination would be some finite small. I see, but not some finite thing that depends on the size of the sliver, just some finite answer. You I think it would depend on the size of the sliver. Yeah. Right, but here you're not getting anything that depends on the size of the sliver, right? You're getting zero or some yeah, finite he, answer. Yeah, here, that's right. Here, I, I, I haven't regulated at all. I'm putting the stuff right on the horizon, but I think in a more honest computation, you'd have to open it up a little bit. I, well, I'm not trying to dismiss it. I think it's a legitimate thing to worry about. I, I, I don't really understand what the correct interpretation is, but if you regulate it, which I think you might have to do a little bit, then you get answers that I think are reasonable and consistent, finite and scale with the size of the region. I mean, they have very small dependence on it because the region doesn't grow very much. If you reg you know, it grows an amount set by how much you regulate by. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So here I tried to argue that this isn't a crazy behavior if your system is not at infinite temperature. And now I'd just like to end with giving an example of a system. I don't think it's a system that's actually relevant for De Sitter space, but it's a system which realizes this entropy curve, okay? It's the dumbest system that we could think of that realizes it. it's just a Heisenberg antiferromagnet. So you have two uh, spins, sigma and tau, two qubits. Here's the interaction, J is positive. And this is an exactly solvable system. You could put the system in the density matrix E to the minus beta H, where this is the Hamiltonian. Um, you can trace out one of the, and you can compute the entropy of zero qubits, one qubit, or two qubits. Okay. The entry of zero qubits is, of course, always zero. At zero temperature, you're in the spin singlet state. Okay. That's the ground state of the system. Um, it's a pure state, so the entry of two qubits is zero. And the entry of one qubit is maximally mixed, it's log two. Okay. At infinite temperature, the whole thing is maximally mixed. Okay. Uh, it's maximally entangled with its thermal field double partner. It's one way to think about the purification of the system. Uh, and so it has a linear entropy curve. Two qubits is two log two, one qubit is one log two, zero qubits is zero, okay? Now you can ask, what about an intermediate temperature? You might worry that the entropy of one qubit moves off this log two point, but actually the system has an SU2 symmetry for the density matrix of one qubit, which makes it maximally mixed. It keeps it pinned at log two. Uh, then it's clear there's gonna be some intermediate temperature where the entry of two qubits sits between two log two and zero, and in particular sits right at log two. Okay, and that temperature is some order one number times J. So you get this sort of entropy curve, um, which is of course easy to reproduce when these red dots are the only physical data and the blue things are just interpolating lines. Uh, the harder thing is to reproduce this in some self-interacting large end quantum mechanical system where you actually fill out this curve. But I, I think that it's still instructive because I think the features of this are somewhat similar to features that a theory that uh, a dual to the sitter space might have, which is that it's very non-local. You never have a large um, surface to volume ratio. And so entropy curves end up looking like this. Okay, it's just a simple toy model. All right, let me summarize uh, and then I'll uh, take more questions if uh, there are more questions. The first point I wanna emphasize is that the cosmic horizon is actually very different than the black hole horizon. Geometrically, um, it's a mini max surface instead of a maxi min surface. So it doesn't naively work as a classical or quantum extremal surface. But if you sort of change the rules of the game a little bit and anchor surfaces to the horizon, because you believe the dual theory lives on the horizon somehow, then you can actually use the horizon area and its associated entropy without running into these violations of entanglement wedge nesting. Okay, I don't, I don't know of like a general proof that, that this happens. Um, 
But in all the examples uh, that we've looked at, there's no issue with entanglement wedge nesting. And there are some arguments which go most of the way in saying that you won't run into these problems, basically because the horizon is what's called the holographic screen. And there are certain arguments related to preserving entanglement wedge nesting when you anchor surfaces to a holographic screen. Okay, uh, Desitter space is the wild, wild west. It's hard to check answers that you get against anything. So I think it would be helpful to think about this prescription in the context of black holes. It's not clear that it should be true in that case. It's possible this prescription is true for cosmic horizons and false for black hole horizons or vice versa. But you can at least try and probe it a little bit, anchor extremal surfaces to, let's say, the event horizon of the thermal field double, and try and check the answers you get um, against uh, in some ways using constraints of ADS-CFT. We've learned a lot about entropies in ADS-CFT and how to compute them. So you might hope that you can, uh, you can make some progress on this question. And another thing that um, I didn't really emphasize too much is, you know, in this talk, I was really thinking about global de-sitter space. And that actually entered in a crucial way in how I thought about the holographic dual. For example, the fact that I said that the dual is on a pair of horizons, I think that's only because I considered global de-sitter space with this past infinity. If you have a more general cosmology, like the one in our universe, um, which has like a big bang and then asymptotes of the sitter, I don't know of a way to encode that on one or a pair or some finite number of horizons. The structure of that is very different. And I don't actually know of a sort of clean way to think about how encoding should, should work there. You know, there's a sense in global de Sitter, the fact that you can get away with, you know, in in future infinity of the city, you can have all sorts of stuff. You can imagine putting all these states near scribe plus, and you can ask how can two quantum systems with Hilbert spaces of this finite size area before G, how can they encode all that stuff you could put at future infinity? But the way global de Sitter space gets around that problem is that it has conditioned on there being this bounce in the space time. And one reason why it's difficult to take bounces seriously as a model of cosmology uh, is that they're, they're difficult to, they're very delicate. If you put stuff in, uh, if you put in some excitations or some matter and you try and go through a bounce, it tends to crunch the space time. So similarly, if you put stuff at future infinity in the sitter space and then rewound the clock, the space time would crunch. Okay, so you're actually limited in how much stuff you can put up there. Uh, there's some bottleneck at t equals zero. And I think that's why global de sitter space can get away with doing this encoding uh, with this pretty finite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay. The, Finally, the most uh, interesting thing which I, I'm, I'm currently thinking about is, um, or I'm curious to think about, is to find a microscopic model which matches these features. In particular, some large N model which has an entropy curve which looks like this. You know, it's possible that this model error curve is correct, but we don't really know, but it's not a very constraining curve. Any system you take and put it infinite temperature will give you this curve. Okay, so it's hard to use it to constrain the, the dual. So, this curve gives you more of a chance to do that. Of course, you're assuming it's correct. Um, but if you took a system like, I don't know, double-scaled SYK or something that people have some reason to believe is relevant for de Sitter space, computed its entropy curve and found a curve like this, I think that would be a pretty striking uh, signal that there's something correct going on. Um, yeah, okay, I'll stop there and thanks for the questions. Yeah. Let's thank Edgar for a very illuminating talk. Thank you. So I had a question. Am I audible? Yeah. 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 So in the exterior, can we can we have matter in the in the exterior of the of the cosmic horizon? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't really study any of those examples. I mean, uh, we have an example in our paper where we imagine pair creating a, a black holes and having them go into the exterior region, and then you could compute and find things that happen there. Um, you you can you can have stuff like that. Yeah. So if the Hawking radiation of the of the exterior of 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 the cosmic horizon comes with within the interior, how will that affect the ex extremal surface which we are trying to find? Will that affect anyhow? Um. Um. So that so it, so far in this talk, I was at least in the second part of this talk, I was um, only doing classical extremal surfaces, so I wasn't really considering the Hawking radiation. Um. Uh, I don't, yeah, for, for computations like the entropy of the entire horizon, I don't think it's going to affect anything. You're going to pick up um, whatever matter entropy you have from the quantum fields in the bulk, um, including the Hawking quanta or whatever you have. 
but it's not going to build up in the way that it does for a black hole because you know because the cosmic horizon surrounds you what happens is it emits hawking radiation and then at a later point in time it just reabsorbs its own hawking radiation so it's sort of eternal it keeps itself uh at the same size by constantly absorbing whatever it is that it's emitting so i think there won't be some sort of buildup effect uh due to that so i don't think it'll make a, a big quantitative difference it'll matter for an example i didn't talk about the schwarzschild black hole in disorder space because uh, that's unstable due to um, even perturbative stuff due to Hawking radiation. So for those types of computations, it'll make a difference. But for your pure de-sitter, um, I don't think it's it's really going to make a difference. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Edgar? Well, if not, uh, let's thank Edgar again for a great talk. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the uh, Sure. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thanks again for the questions. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Bye, thank everybody. You. Take care. Bye.